Good evening, good evening and welcome to the first ever episode of Last Jazz Week tonight. My name is Fiona Steilantony and I will be your host for the night and for the coming weeks. Um, I'm very, very excited for this new show. I know that some people have been wondering about the title, what does it mean, what's going to happen on this show. Uh, but basically, Last Jazz Week tonight is going to be a mix of a news show uh, where we're looking at what has been happening in the chess world over the, the past week, as well um, as having some guests on some, uh, hopefully in the future, well, this week as well as in the future, some relevant guests to whatever has been happening that week in the chess world. We will talk about what they have been up to, um, but also get to know them a bit better. So basically a mix, a mix of two things. And for this very first week, um, and oh, very important, I forgot. I also want to get you guys involved in the chat. So I'll be keeping an eye uh, on the Twitch chat as well as on the Chess24 page where this, uh, this show is being hosted. As for tonight, I have two guests on. First of all, will be joining me Sweden's number one grandmaster, Niels Grandelius. And uh, I think I'm gonna bring him over right now. Right now. I think he has the show on in the background. <laughs> but let's bring on Niels, who will have to pause the show. Niels, are you enjoying the show so far? I am, uh, well, it's a bit early to say, but I, uh, yeah, sure. Okay, the show is now muted in the background, so we've gotten rid of our echo. Niels, you are my very first ever guest on Last Jazz Week tonight. I told you I was a bit nervous, but you seem all nice and relaxed. Yeah, it's it's quite rare that I'm too nervous. Actually, uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> so, Niels, I guess uh, first of all, um, we should probably introduce you to the audience. Um, I actually also realized maybe I should have introduced myself as well. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Fiona, a woman I am from Luxembourg and I'm also a streamer. And as is Niels, these days he's not quite as active, but I think his more famous uh, claim to fame uh, on top of just being a streamer is you're Sweden's number one grandmaster and you have been for a long time at this stage. Yeah, I don't actually know how long, but some some five-ish years, I guess, something like that, five, six years. And how, so I have a few topics for you, but the first one, um, let's talk about, it. well, there's been, there's been a pandemic, of course, raging across the world for the last, the last seven, eight months now. Uh, so tell us, well, how have you been keeping busy because you were a very active professional player? Um, playing a lot of tournaments, which now is not so much of an option anymore. So what have you been up to the last few months? Uh, a bit of each. I, I mean, first of all, I, I did play two tournaments during this period, two classical tournaments, let's say. Uh, I played one Grandmaster tournament in Copenhagen in the summer in July, and I played the Spanish League uh, just a month ago or a bit less. Uh, so those two, of course, were the, the two main events. And then I have been doing... Uh, some I have played some smaller events as well, uh, like some blitz and rapid tournaments over the board. But apart from that, of course, it has been mainly going on online for me. Uh, I played a lot of uh, different uh, tournaments uh, of, on various sites online. And uh, I mean, apart from that, uh, I've been streaming, as you mentioned. I was streaming a lot during the summer mainly. Uh, a couple of months tried that and uh, but now nowadays i'm doing more uh, coaching and uh, webinars and commentary and and so on uh, basically every week and uh, well i actually pulled up the first photo you mentioned you have been playing the spanish league quite recently i think apart from the bundesliga one of the only weeks to which sort of um started up again so we see you there second on the right in your mask so how was it playing uh playing in the league with these new new conditions and uh, new measures uh, it was uh, pretty <laughs> confusing at the beginning because i th i think the organizers as well i mean it was the first time for them as well uh so actually 
well, first of all, just to explain how it how it was going on. Uh, every round before it started, they were checking the temperatures of the players to make sure that no one had fever. And then you had to wear a mask throughout the game. And you were not allowed uh, to uh, walk around uh, freely in the playing hall, which was actually quite important because in the beginning of the tournament, uh, they actually said that you were not allowed to walk at all, meaning you couldn't even see your teammates' games. So that, of course, was uh, incredibly strange for a team tournament. Uh, but after a, few, uh, a day or two, they understood that, okay, at least you need to be able to see your teammates' uh, games. And after that, okay, this mask is, of course, uh, not that pleasant, but it's also something that uh, not everyone, but, but most people will get used to without uh, uh, any major issues. For instance, I, I got used to it pretty quickly and it didn't really affect me that much. So I, I thought it was fine to play. I was wondering, overall. actually, I was going to ask you about that wearing mask. I mean, I haven't tried it. Uh, maybe people in the chat can let us know. Have they played with a mask on? Have they played tournaments uh, in those new conditions? Because I, I always feel like oh, it's a very different uh, thing, you know, wearing my mask when I go into the supermarket for 10 minutes or wearing it for, for a game for, you know, that can go up to four, five, six hours. Did you feel that it had any impact on your your play? Yeah, but I, I think they did a smart thing. They actually decreased uh, the time control a bit so that the games would be slightly shorter. Uh, so then, because the difference, I think, is quite uh, quite big between three, four hours and like six hours, as you say. Yeah. Uh, and this three, four hours was, I think, quite fine. So it's, of course, uh, I mean, you can easily forget when you, uh, uh, when you want to drink some water or something like that, but... Uh, uh, I mean, I did not have any unpleasant experiences. It's as actually, such, so. it's interesting that in Spain they decreased the time control because, for example, the Irish Championship, which was played this summer, they increased the time control because I think they had some extra measures that you had to disinfect your hands and the way you were pressing the clock and all that. And so they increased the time control. But I am kind of in your camp, I think, to rather decrease than increase. Yeah, I really think decreasing makes a lot more sense. Uh. And let's let's see now. I have one more photo, which uh, I think you sent me. Actually, there you are with your with your teammates. So tell us a bit about your team and how did how did you do in the Spanish league? Yeah, we did not uh, do very well, to be perfectly honest. Uh, uh, personally, I, I did sort of okay. I was undefeated, but I made a bit too many draws, but wasn't a big disaster, but uh, I, I think uh, some other players, for instance, Navarra was interviewed the other day on, on Chess24 and he was uh, explaining how he, in fact, did not really want to play and how this mask was quite unpleasant to play with and how the whole situation did not uh, seem very enjoyable to him. And, he, and he, of course, in such a situation, it, it's very difficult to perform at your best. Uh, and when you have one or two players like that in a six members team, it's very unlikely that you will do very well. So, I mean, we were fighting our best. We were doing what we could, but we ended up, I think, third, maybe even fourth. I mean, we were uh, top seed and we were clearly going for gold. So we yeah. didn't really care about the rest of other... The rest uh, so much. I mean, we had, a, we had a good time, of course, together, but... Uh, yeah, I think the situation really did not... Uh, how was the social... I mean, how much were you even... What were the regulations in Spain at the time? How much were you even allowed to hang out or to, you know, what what was going on outside of the, the tournament? Yeah, so the big thing was that in the Spanish Championship, which ended a couple of weeks before the, uh, the Spanish League, uh, there were some uh, occasions with the people partying, I think, in the evenings after the game. So, like, during play, it was very strict, but in the evenings... People did not follow the rules really, and uh, they had quite a few cases there. It uh, was a big scandal, yeah, for the Spanish. It, it was uh, sort of a big scandal. Yeah. There was there were even a player uh, still quarantined at at the hotel where we played from the Spanish Championship. Incredible. Uh, we just stayed. Yeah, so that was a bit unpleasant. So actually, once w when we arrived, uh, the tournament doctor he explained to us very very clearly that. Uh, what you should do is you should stay within your team. This is very important. Uh, but within your team, it's such a small group of people, so there, sort of, you can behave more or less normally. So, so for us as a team, I mean, we went to dinners as we usually did, 
of course, kept a big distance to other groups, but within the group, it was sort of fine. Uh, so the big difference, of course, was that, okay, normally I would uh, talk to most people who are actually playing in the tournament because that's uh, that's who I am. And, uh, and I really didn't because I tried to follow uh, the doctor's orders. So yeah. uh, that was the main thing, I think, for me. Of course. And how did you cope with the not walking around? Because I think you're also a player who likes to walk around quite a bit during games or... Yeah, I think for me, to be perfectly honest, I think it's not a bad thing to have someone uh, telling me to sit down all the time or even have rules uh, persuading me to do it. And one last question about the, the Spanish league before we move on, because uh, you, you had another big event where you were not playing, uh, but you were at Norway Chess, which just concluded recently. But you said you had played only one tournament during the summer. And then the last one before that was probably well at the start of the year, January, February. Yeah, last one before that was the Prague Masters. Which was in uh, February, end of in February. In February, yeah, exactly, early February. And how did you deal with having, how rusty did you feel when you came back to the board? Or did you feel like there was more an element of rustiness or more an element of being eager to come back to the chessboard or a mix? A mix Not of very board? rusty, I mean... Uh... I, I, I frankly speaking, because I played this tournament in late July, so it was like a bit more than four months break, if my math is correct. Mm -hmm. Actually, five months, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah anyway, it was a long break. Uh, it was for sure the longest break since I started playing chess, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very worried how it would go. But you know, in such a situation, I think it's very important how uh, how it goes in the beginning, like. Uh, in this first round, I immediately got some very pleasant position, incredibly safe. Mm -hmm. I could play on, I could calm down, and uh, within like an hour into the game, I already forgot about all those uh, feelings. Uh, and uh, I mean, of course, I made some uh, uh, some mistakes and so on, but uh, I won a couple of games in the beginning, and of course, then you become much more relaxed, and uh, and the rest of it was was sort of fine actually. Okay, so that's that about the Spanish League. And actually, my next topic was not going to be Norway Chess just yet, but since we were talking about the Spanish League, there's actually been uh, some big, big news. That kept, well, not big news, but there was a this thing here happened, which uh, I think there was an interview between Daniel Dubov and the president of the FIDE, uh, of FIDE, Arkady Dvokovic, which was translated to English courtesy of Chestex. So this is a screen grab. Uh, that I took off their website, where basically, I'm not going to read it all out, but Vokovic basically suggested that, um, a bit like in football or in other sports, that chess players going forward should maybe only play uh, for one team, uh, rather than in, at the moment, you can basically have a team in every country. Uh, so first question, how many, how many teams do you play for in how many leagues? Uh, currently, I play for three only. Uh, I mean, at, at least regularly. I play in Norway, of course, mm -hmm. for Volerenga, mm -hmm. with, uh, with whom I played in the European Club Cup twice. Alongside Magnus Carlsen. Alongside Magnus Carlsen the first time, yeah, and second time alongside David Howell. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, then of course Spain, as we just discussed. And then I'm playing in the Bundesliga, uh, so uh, for, uh, for Hamburg, since uh, I think uh, also five, uh, five years. Uh, so that is not not that much. Previously, of course, I have been play playing in Swedish league and Danish league as well, Icelandic league. And I, uh, English league. And English league, actually, <laughs> yeah. I mean, a few games for, for Chettleton. Uh, but, but but it's rare. And, and, and generally speaking, like the three, uh, Spain and Germany and, and Norway are the big ones for me currently. And so what are your thoughts on this suggestion, which I think came as a big shock. Okay, at this point, it, it's been, I think, about two weeks since this interview came out. But I know there was a, a big discussion uh, on Twitter. I think actually Peter Heine Nielsen was one of the biggest advocates uh, against this. And there was also, let me put it up, there was this tweet conducted by Alex Kolovich, who is the president of the Association of Chess uh, Professionals. Uh, which the, that poll was quite um, quite one-sided. Should ch professional chess players be limited to playing one league only? And it was a whopping 85% uh, no. So what are, uh, what are your thoughts on the topic? 
uh, I, I think it's important to understand that there are two uh, two parts of this question uh, because within the current system how, how it looks and uh, how it functions it doesn't make any sense I think and, and for professional players like myself or uh, other professionals not maybe so much me personally but like players of more or less my level and uh, my, my way of life then uh, it would be a big uh, big blow for us, of course, to not have all this income throughout uh, the different leagues. Yeah, but there's actually, there was a question in the chat. Is uh, playing leagues a big source of income, not just for you, but for most for most chess professionals? I, I mean, for me, it, it is not really. I mean, I'm, I'm focusing on, on bigger tournaments and uh, and so on. Uh, but it's a part, definitely. But, but for other players, I know that it's maybe their main uh, source of income, which is... Uh, uh, a little bit different, yeah. Uh, but but the point is that uh, I think the way at least I understood it was that they would like to change the system so that you get much more attached with you, with your club. Maybe I mean the season would probably become much longer. Uh, I mean many more games, and then maybe payment would increase as well. And if if we have such a such a system instead, and then it would make a lot of sense to maybe have only one. Uh, one club in which you play for, like, you know, instead of uh, five times a year, you maybe go there 15 or 20 times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would um, probably rather play 15 times for the for one club than time. five times each for three different ones, yeah? Uh, I mean, then really we could, I think for the for the fans, it would be sort of... Uh, but it's also more, very uh, difficult for the International Federation to implement, don't you think? Because then Exactly, I, I, the, to... I think the main point here is that we are very far from such a, mm -hmm. such a situation. And therefore... Uh, I mean, it's it's nice to have this uh, utopic view, but uh, uh, we should start probably in that angle rather than start to forbid uh, people from playing in many countries. So do you uh, think I, that I think is... they are starting from the wrong way, yeah, let's say. Do you think that is what it is for now, just a utopic view? I, I think it's it's definitely quite possible to change it in the future. Uh, but I think I think you cannot answer one question unrelated to the other one, where you have to take them both as, uh, as as one issue. There was also an argument being made, I think, online that uh, it's hard, well, first of all, it's very hard to compare chess to a sport like football or other sports where there's so much money involved. Uh, involved. But also the, the other problem is chess is an, an individual sport rather than a team sport. It feels like the team aspect is just a small, a small part of what the chess world is, unlike football where you know the players are hardly ever just representing the club without playing you know yeah, yeah of course it's it's a big difference that it's individual I do believe that okay things like team spirit and so on it's definitely important but uh, uh, I mean even even though let's say everyone plays stronger than they usually do if they are considerably worse than the lineup of world-class players then it doesn't matter that they have yeah. better team spirit of course uh, so yeah, it, it's different, but uh, the idea in itself is, I think, not uh, not so bad. Do you think we'll be hearing much more of this in the near future, or do you think this has this was sort of something that was said in an interview and that's going to be put to bed again for for the ne near future? I think, like I said, in in itself, the idea is maybe interesting, but. Uh, uh, if you make a list of priorities for the uh, for the world of chess, I think it's not very high on that list. So uh, I do believe it will it will take quite some time before we see any changes. What actually, in your opinion, what is very high up uh, the list of priorities for the chess world? I uh, to be honest, I I really don't uh, don't know. <laughs> for you as a uh, chess player, if you could implement one change, or what is the one change that you think would be most beneficial to to professional players? Let's say. Currently, when so much is going on online, I mean, it's it's I think some. Uh, uh, for one part, this uh, anti cheating and so on, because that's a huge problem online, but also to sort of. If they are really going to go for this online thing, then to make some sort of uh, clearer uh, uh, cooperation between uh, the World Chess Federation and uh, and the big chess sites. Uh, so, like, let's say, for instance, that you cheat on on an online chess playing site, then maybe you can get some punishment also for over the board chess. For, for instance, I mean, to have some sort of uh, streamlining the the things a little bit. How much, to make it more serious as well. 
How much do you enjoy playing online and how much does this cheating problem, which undeniably is probably the biggest problem in the chess world right now, how much does it bother you or how much does it deter you from, from playing online? It doesn't re no, it doesn't deter me at all from playing online, uh, but uh, it's it's still a big problem. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I agreed with uh, with uh, what uh, Levon Aronian said in, in Norway, that he was asked this question, I think, by you or something similar. And uh, he replied that, okay, well, first of all, we are chess players, yeah? So when we are allowed to play chess, we are very happy. Then, okay, uh, we would probably prefer to play over the board. But even when we are only allowed to play uh, online, we are still very happy yeah, to be able to do that. Yeah. So, and this is sort of my, my take as well. Uh, uh, I, I just like to play and then, uh, okay, if online is what is on offer, then I will play online and that's, that's it and that's fine. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting, an interesting few months coming up to see how they each develop, how many people are going to be willing to take the step. And that brings me to my next topic, of course, how many organizers are going to be willing uh, to organize an over the board event like the one we just had in, Alti uh, in Norway, the Altibox Norway Chess Tournament. We were both there. I was working on the event and you were also working at the event, you were a commentator for the TV2, which was hosting the, the tournament on Norwegian, commentating on the uh, tournament on the Norwegian TV. So first of all, what did you make of, I think, the playing conditions? I think the, player as, the players were very, very happy, all the ones that I talked to, to be able to play, unlike the photos we just saw of you in the Spanish league with the mask and all that here. Basically, the only thing that was different in Norway chess from a normal tournament was the players were not allowed to shake hands. And then we saw these very nice uh, alternatives coming up. All the photos from Norway, by the way, are courtesy of Leonard Otis, who was the official photographer on site. Um, so first of all, what, just, what did you make of the tournament as a whole? No, it was, I think, a great success. I mean... Uh... Uh, it, it went, as far as I could tell, very smoothly. Uh, everything uh, worked fine. Players, as you said, I mean, were incredibly happy to be allowed to play chess. It was very visible. Uh, and, uh, yeah, no, frankly speaking, it was very impressive by the organizers to uh, to do it anyway, let's say, or yeah, to go so through with it, despite the very difficult uh, surrounding uh, surroundings. Absolutely. So for the people who might not be aware, the tournament was originally scheduled for May or June. And then it was cancelled, of course, uh, not cancelled, postponed because of the, the pandemic and now scheduled for October. Uh, but it was a very different tournament. So basically both you and myself and the players and all the staff coming in from abroad, we all quarantined for 10 days uh, before the tournament. And... Uh, and so that meant that we were in sort of a bubble. That's why we did not later have to wear masks or why there was no plexiglass or things like like that used. But do you think this can be replicated in the future for other, other big tournaments? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, you have, will have to ask uh, the players what they thought about the quarantine, if, if they were fine with it. But uh, as I said, I, it seemed to me that... Uh, the thing, I mean, that they were allowed to play chess was more important than the sufferings from the quarantine, uh, for sure. And, uh, uh, well, uh, it was also, as you said, it was very nice for them to not have to wear the masks and, and all these things. Uh, so I, I think, uh, especially for such a closed uh, uh, tournament, uh, pretty small here, only uh, six players, but maybe normally you would have ten, which still would be very small. And with... Uh, sort of relatively high budget as as they have in the top tournaments. So I think uh, it's definitely possible. Also, Norway, uh, of course, is a bit less affected uh, by the virus than other countries. So it's it's hard to even maybe compare. I mean, if other countries have different restrictions, it might be hard. Yeah, but to... even when it's a bit uh, where it's a bit stricter, it would still be like because there are so few players involved, yeah, and they are putting so much effort into mm -hmm. uh, into everyone being safe. So I, I think it's. I think basically they proved that it's it's quite possible to uh, to organize. It was an incredibly fighting tournament. Did you put it down to what did you put it down to? There were so few draws. Um, I'm not going to suggest anything, but what what was your explanation between how few draws and how much fighting chess we saw? 
Yeah, uh, we were discussing this quite heavily on, on Norwegian TV as well. Uh, and, uh, well, there are many different factors. One is, of course, uh, that the players were very eager to play. They maybe had more ideas. I mean, they were inspired and so on. Second, Secondly, they were, of course, very rusty, which meant that more mistakes were made. Uh, which, uh, of course, also m makes for more decisive results. Then the time control was uh, this... Uh, TV time control. Yeah, very strange. Like uh, two hours for 40 moves and then 10 seconds increment. <laughs> this also, uh, I mean, it's it's quite weird and it's quite short, so this also helps. And the point and then system, the, of course, as well. The final point, which I think is also very important, which... Uh, I mean, it's a bit difficult uh, how to how to say it in the nicest way, but uh, there was one player who was considerably lower rated than than the rest of the field, and this basically always creates uh, a higher uh, win winning percentage mm. compared to to draws. Not only because the player will most likely lose a lot of games instead of making draws, but also because the dynamics of the tournament, like. Uh, if if you if you get the lower rated player and you win, then you put pressure on the other members uh, of the field, and then they have to try harder for the win. Maybe even uh, there will be counterattacking possibilities and so on. Like the dynamics, it it becomes much sharper immediately. Yeah. So I I think all of those factors combined were uh, were part of the reason. And I have no idea which one was the bigger one in this case. Interesting, interesting thoughts. Now let's talk about. We talked about that it was a bit of a TV uh, studio because one thing that Norway has done fantastically. I mean, there's been such a huge boom, of course, I think everyone knows about Magnus Carlsen and everything that happened. I mean, people in Norway love chess and they have brought uh, chess to mainstream television. So this photo is of your studio, which was on site. So you are on the right, then to your left, John Ludwig Hammer, who's sort of one of the main anchors. That's Magnus uh, and uh, then Fingna. So what do you make, um, how, first of all, how was the experience of being a, a primetime TV commentator? And uh, do you think that other countries may be able to follow suit with what Norway has done? Now, first of all, for me, it was, it was the second time. I did it also in December during the Grand Chess Tour Finals. Uh, but then, of course, we were not on site. We were in a TV studio in in Bergen, in in, uh, in Norway. Uh, but yeah, no, it's it's very nice uh, uh, experience, of course, for me uh, to be able. I mean, what we are doing is basically we are explaining chess to a level where people, I would say, barely knows the rules. That mm -hmm. is sort of our target group, which is, I think, most people. Yeah, they know the rules. They know probably they know the value of pieces in general, uh, but they don't really know ma that much uh, more than that. And that is an interesting target group because you have to you have to be able to explain uh, what is going on in the games conceptually and theoretically, but you can't really sort of give lines because they don't really make sense. I mean, it's very, very hard mm -hmm. for the for the audience to follow, but you but you can still explain what is going on in uh, in sort of more general terms. And that is actually uh, a challenge and and the skill to be able to do that, which I think is quite interesting because it makes you, it makes you also think about chess in a slightly different way. I was wondering, mm -hmm. did you do any special preparation? Because of course you have done commentary for some top, uh, for some top tournaments, and when you talk to a chess crowd, it's so much different. You know, they're interested in the details and in the theory, and in the the lines. Um, but when you talk to this uh, mainstream mainstream media audience, do you how did you prepare for this job? Uh, I didn't. I mean, I was uh, watching their their broadcast during the quarantine because I was quarantined for the first four rounds because <laughs> I had to have ten days after Spain, so I, I did not have time to be there from the start. Uh, I watched that, and okay. Uh, apart from that, not really. I I was just. Uh, trying to uh, to focus very much when I did it and really think about uh, how am I going to express this and how how do I explain this in the in the best possible way and so on uh, because I, I don't think it's easier I think if anything it's more difficult than than to do commentary for uh, for a stronger audience you you have to be more careful with mm -hmm. what you are saying and so on so just uh, an increased focus that was the main thing no real preparation Interesting. And of course, you were there moving on. One of the main stories uh, at Norway Chess 
was Magnus's uh, loss to Jan Christoph Duda, ending his incredible 125 game uh, unbeaten streak. You know Magnus well, uh, you have been a second for him uh, at the World Championship match, something we'll talk about a bit later. But what did you make uh, of that game and also of the streak? No, first of all, the streak. Well, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it's it's very unlikely that anyone will ever uh, ever do something like that again. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, just impressive. I mean, he was. What is the most impressive? Maybe is uh, the way he played the games. Like uh, he was definitely not being more defensive because he wanted to keep the the streak. No, he was fighting his utmost and taking mm-hmm. huge risks in many, many, many of those games. So that, that of course, is just, uh, I mean, it's incredibly impressive, of course, uh, and probably can only be done by him. Uh, and the game against Duda, well, uh, I mean, it, it looked actually very interesting what he was doing. He was taking some risk, but he was getting very nice counterplay. I actually predicted uh, during the Norwegian show on TV. <laughs> I that... remember this. <laughs> I, I predict it became a bit famous, but after some, I don't know, 16, 17 moves or something like that, we were beginning to discuss about uh, this, uh, how much time they were spending and how much they would have after the time control on move 40 and so on. And I sort of cut them off by saying that, okay, but there is no way Duda will survive until move 40. Uh, which became a bit famous because then, uh, of course, he, he managed to, to win the game even, so... Uh, uh, yeah, but that's what we were all feeling at the time. Like there was incredible pressure on Duda. Position was very unpleasant. He was burning a lot of time. But then he started to defend uh, very, very well. And uh, okay, the position was very complicated. And Magnus made one or two sort of hesitant decisions. And uh, that was enough for uh, for Duda to, to turn it around completely. Uh, and how did you... I yeah. was actually... I was surprised Magnus briefly joined you guys in the studio after. I thought he was going to be running off uh, fuming, but he seemed to take it quite well. And, and how far do you think that it's always almost some pressure of his shoulder, you know, to that the streak... There's no more streak talk on the table, at least for the the near future. Yeah, to... I. Um, I don't think that it actually matters that much to him. Uh, mm. I mean, this, this is just me guessing. I want to be clear on that, but I wouldn't think so. But on the other hand, I know that he is... Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, he doesn't like to lose, yeah. let's say. Yeah? He definitely doesn't. So any loss in any situation would make him very uh, very angry, of course. What did he uh, say? Yeah, no, he, he was he actually... Yeah, he was... Uh, sorry? What did he say in the studio afterwards, after the loss? I mean, some very brief points of of the key moments in the game, basically, and and that was it. But uh, but he did explain. Uh, he did explain it. He did stay there for a few minutes, uh, which was uh, very impressive. Like he he didn't after the last round. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, well, on that top, I know I wait. Da, da, da. Uh, on that topic. I just realized I wanted to show, I forgot to upload it. I wanted to ask you your thoughts. Let me bring up the photo. I wanted to ask you your thoughts about uh, the other big story of the tournament, of course, uh, is Ali Reza, who had a fantastic, uh, fantastic showing in the tournament. What did you make of his of his performance? Uh, very impressive, of course. Very, very impressive. Uh... Well, I mean, what can I say? It's clear that he is uh, <laughs> becoming a, a, one of the strongest players in the world, I think. Uh, he is also, I think, one one of the players who plays the most online. So, like, maybe this lack of practice that some of the other participants might have, he definitely doesn't. So, that, of course, is useful for him. But also, yes, the way he plays. I mean, he plays aggressive. He plays for the win with both colors. I mean, uh, he doesn't really shy away from from the fights. Yeah, and he also, what I thought, he really shows shades of this Magnus thing of like hating to lose. I mean, when he lost this Armageddon game against Magnus himself, right? I think when he sort of threw the pieces on the board and I mean, he really seems to really be so passionate and to want it so much. Now this is uh, this is clear, but you could also see in the last round he was uh, very very nervous. I mean, it was actually funny because we asked the him. Second and, like, the second last round yeah? against Magnus. Or? Sorry. The second last round against Magnus. Yeah, yeah, against Magnus. Yeah, it was the penultimate round. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 
I mean, we actually I asked him, and and he was claiming that it it had nothing to do with nerves. He was not nervous. He was just uh, he, low on time and and stressed. But uh, I, I I do believe that he was the only person in the world who thought he wasn't nervous. Uh, the footage and that's was okay. very it's, clear. A, it's of course. Uh, uh, n not very good, but uh, it's the sort of thing that uh, with experience usually disappears. Uh, but it's not uh, it's not a certainty that it will. And I mean, he definitely has to become more stable in, in those situations. Uh, because the, the sort of mistake he did, I understand uh, uh, in such a situation, it's very tense. I mean, you can you can do actually any any sort of mistake because it simply doesn't have anything to do with chess. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be in such a state of mind is is not a good thing for a professional chess player and uh, that's definitely something he uh, i mean if he doesn't uh, disappear automatically he will work, have to work very very hard to uh, yeah. to fight it absolutely Niels. before we move on from the norway chess topic a question from matt book or matt book uh, who is coming to us from sweden and he is wondering did you speak swedish with the norwegians or english no, I speak uh, Swedish on the Norwegian television, uh, and they understand uh, basically everything I say. It's it's very similar languages, so and not the, an issue. Okay, and the last question about Ali Reza Maripant is wondering, uh, how do you move on as Ali Reza from a loss like the one uh, against Magnus, which was really a very tough loss to take for those who haven't seen it. I think those will be very few of you, but Ali Reza lost what is almost an elementary pawn ending. Uh, at the the very last moment. So how do you, what's your advice? How do you deal with that? Mm, well, there is no no, no good way. Yeah? I mean, uh, I, I think basically what you do is you just uh, forget about, I mean, you, you just focus on something else. And uh, well, here there was a new game the day after, so he could focus on that one, I think. Yeah. And he won that game and still, even when I interviewed him after that game, he was still so disappointed from, from the previous days. So I think it shows you, I, I guess it's, he's still not completely over it, but he, I'm sure he will be. No, of course, it's a great pit. The it would have been uh, very nice to hold uh, this game against Magnus. He was playing for tournament victory, but uh, I mean, it happens. Yeah, and it, it happens to uh, everyone who is a professional chess player. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it, there is no good way of, uh, I mean, it, it sucks, yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Sorry, yeah, there is no better way to put it. But I'm sure Ali Reza will be back. He already, yet last night, he won the title arena. Um, I saw he's also active a bit on Twitch, so I'm sure I'm sure he'll be back very soon. Uh, and now let's talk about, I mentioned, uh, I prepared these photos. I'm probably going to surprise you. I did not tell you, but I found some, <laughs> some old photo of you with Magnus. Niels has a tiny delay before they pop up. Uh, but you were a second for Magnus's World Championship match. Uh, in 2016 against Karyakin? Uh, yeah. And, and in 2018 against Karana. And 2018. I was never even sure if that was confirmed. So two, uh, two matches where you were on the right or on the winning side of history uh, working for, for Magnus. Um, so tell us a bit, uh, how, was the, how was that experience? And I don't know how much you can say about how that came along. Uh, but tell us, tell us about how, what is it like uh, to work as a second for such a huge match and for the reigning world champion? Well, uh, first of all, how it, how it came about, I think it was uh, after uh, Norway Chess the year I played. I actually played Norway Chess myself uh, <laughs> after winning a qualification tournament in 2016. Well, actually and, the uh, photo on the right, I don't... I yeah, think... the photo on the right is from that, that one as well, uh, actually. So. Uh, yeah, a couple of months after that, I was invited to one of the one of the camps, like uh, quite long before the uh, the match would start. I think I don't remember exactly, but let's say four or five months maybe before. Uh, I mean, we did work uh, with the whole team, and uh, it was sort of a I, I would say more or less a trial. Like I mean, to I see how. I was just gonna ask. Yeah. I, I mean, no, it was not uh, officially a trial, but that's like. Okay, you are you are invited for a week or two to to work a bit and uh, I mean see first of all how how is the quality of your work in general 
and also how do you fit into the group which is also very very important because it's such a long time you have to work together and okay i mean uh, i don't want to draw any conclusions but i was invited again <laughs> i mean for the sort of more serious work closer to the match and uh, no of course i agreed i mean uh, you cannot really decline when the offer comes from the world champion so uh and uh no, for me, it, it, those two matches have definitely been highlights in my chess career, I would say. It's uh, it's definitely the most interesting thing I, I've, I've done in chess. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. It's a great joy, and I don't really, I don't really mind being on the sort of uh, uh, ringside, let's say, or, you know, being there in the background working, because it's still... Uh, uh, I don't really need need to be, be playing myself. I mean, the work in itself is so interesting, so I, I really enjoyed it both times. Was it in 2016 or 2018 that the, the seconds of Magnus, I think in 2016, right, that you guys were all in Thailand for the duration? The, the, yeah, in, in 2016 we were in, in Kagura in, mm -hmm. in Norway because the match was being played in the US. So, so you were adapting right. yeah, to the time zone, so you're in Norway? Yeah, the time difference meant that we could wake up early in the morning, work all day and then go to bed more or less when the game started or a bit after that. I think some other members of the team, they prefer to watch more of the game. I prefer to get my sleep. Uh, <laughs> so tell us, actually, the, what does a typical day um, when Magnus is playing the World Championship match and you guys are in the different time zones? So in 60, 2016, the match was in New York, you guys were in Norway. Then in 2018, the match was in London and you guys were in Thailand. Uh, yeah. So as you just explained, so what does a typical day of a second uh, look like? For those weeks. No, I mean, uh, the typical day, of course, like, uh, more or less when they go to bed. Uh, it's almost wake up time for us because of the time difference. And also we have to sort of wake up early to start work. And then uh, we are just, uh, I mean, working, uh, working until our deadline, which is when, uh, when, when Magnus wants to start his own preparation, then he mm -hmm. needs to have the, all the work done. So then we are basically just working until then, of course, with breaks for food and so on. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, the game starts. Some some members of the team, as I said, they follow it a bit more. I generally follow it a bit less uh, to be more fresh the day after when we are working. Uh, and then, I mean, it just goes on like that for, uh, for, for a month or so. How tiring is it? It's very tiring. Let's say uh, compared to yourself playing a tournament, for example, to compare. I don't know. I, I probably more, but I mean, it's also it's also very long, and it's it's longer uh, days, and it's less sleep, and so on. So it, it's but it's also less less intense. Like it's not these huge nerves. I mean, you're never in. Uh, you know, you never have to like in 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 side note, for instance, like uh, or. I was gonna if ask. You, actually, if you make, have... make a bad move, okay. Uh, I mean, you will you will make another one, yeah. In the analysis. <laughs> well, I was gonna ask actually, how much pressure do you feel? No, no, there is of course a lot of a lot of pressure, but like uh, we have pressure to for our final product to be delivered in in top shape, uh, which of course is uh, quite a lot of pressure, but. Uh, this pressure inc happens once a day or once before. Uh, every game and, uh, and when you are playing a game then the pressure is sort of on 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 every move you make yeah let's say so like the there's definitely a lot of pressure and you feel really a big responsibility but the pressure is not uh uh as uh persisting or so like you throughout the day like the pressure comes it increases and then it comes like there comes a, a climax when uh i mean when, when, when after that there is no no pressure anymore and before that okay you still have time to fix what uh, what you did wrong mm -hmm. and how much I don't know how much of this is uh, how much of this can be shared so if I'm asking too many questions just tell me but uh, the team on site I don't know how many people there were I guess around four or five I don't know if you can reveal uh, the numbers I want to ask for the names I think some some are known of course maybe you can tell the ones uh, which are which were known for the matches? Yeah, in Thailand were me, uh, Jan Gustafsson, Laurent Fresnay and Daniel Dubov, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And then uh, Petter Heine Nielsen is sort of the main coach, but he's always there uh, with Magnus on, on the spot. So he's the one who is sort of uh, relaying. Uh, relaying the information and organizing the work and so on, yeah, and make sure that uh, that Magnus is, is feeling comfortable with everything. So those, uh, were, those were my two questions, actually. So the, the four of you that are on site? Like... Yeah, and then, of course, I mean, on, online, it's easy to get help from all, all places in the world. And mm -hmm. uh, who exactly could have been involved there, this I will not... Uh, of course. Uh, this I think we is not generally discussed. So of course, so there's a core team, then there's some random helpers, and there's Peter Heine leading the charge on site. And how does it work? The four of you, actually, I've never asked you this myself, but I think it's quite interesting. The four of you, do you each work like separately, and then you meet up to discuss, or do you work in groups, or is that? I think it depends a lot from team to team, and it also depends a lot uh, from day to day, even mm -hmm. in the teams. I think all all methods are uh, are possible, but in general, uh, let's say, uh, I think it's quite rare that you are solely responsible for for something. Like uh, uh, generally, there is always someone at least uh, browsing through what you what you did or, or double checking it a bit, uh, but. Uh, and and then at the end we are we are all double checking everything together. So like, uh, but but throughout the day and especially on the rest day when you have longer time, uh, I mean it it can vary a lot. I I don't think there is a set uh, set rule or uh, set method. Like it 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 just varies from what feels comfortable on on the day. And so the second stages work together for the match, yeah, on the outside year long. Do you guys ever get involved with Magnus's tournament, or that's just? I think I, it also varies from uh, from from uh, case to case. Uh, but okay, I, let's say I mean for me personally, uh, I'm a very active player. Okay, not now during the pandemic, but in general, I'm a very active player, which of course leaves much less time to work for someone else. Whereas someone like uh, uh, like Gustafsson of Fresine, they are they are playing very little chess, or, or of course Peter Heine Nielsen is. Is playing the least, so they they of course have more time if yeah. if if there is need, but also of course when it's a world championship match there is much more preparation. You need a bigger team. Uh, it makes sense to have more people, so uh, it varies. But but like we could definitely do work at the, any moment, like uh, if we have the time or if if there is the need and so on. So there is no set. Uh, set the way of how it how it would work some very interesting insights there even a lot of things that i was i was not aware of and uh, niels the time time is flying i have prepared one last topic but i think i might be i might be annoying you with this one let's bring up <laughs> let's bring up my photos because it is of course the one thing uh, that a lot of people know you for you're one of the only grandmasters in the world to have sported some very, very impressive uh, dreadlocks for a number of years. So how much, and I know a lot of people, whenever you come up on a stream or whatever, people ask you about the, the dreadlocks. So my first question is, how annoying do you find it that I've now brought up these dreadlocks again? I mean, no, I, I, don't, I don't really mind it at all. I mean... Uh... <laughs> It's fine. It's it's somewhat repetitive, but uh, it doesn't happen that often. I haven't been asked in uh, in a couple of months, probably. When were you? When were you sporting? Were you already a grandmaster when you got them? How old? No, were I got you? the dreadlocks. Actually, I I was only fifteen, I think. Uh, and you became a GM aged seventeen. Seventeen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, no, I got them when I was fifteen, and I had them sort of throughout high school and a bit after that. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot, but at some point it was also time for a change. I mean, I for five years is quite a lot uh, uh, to have the same haircut, I thought. Do so, you ever miss them? No, I miss them, yeah, definitely, but uh, not, uh, not to the point when I would ever consider having something similar again. <laughs> for sure not. Who do uh, you think? Do you think we might see another Grandmaster uh, in the near future sporting dreadlocks? And if you had to venture guess, who do you think would be the most likely to follow your lead? Yeah, this is very tough. I mean, there is there is a American Danish I am called Casa mm -hmm. Of course, who yeah. actually has dreadlocks, and he is like trying to reach, uh, maybe make his final GM norm or something like that. So that could be a guess. 
otherwise, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it somehow, for some very strange reason, doesn't seem to be so popular in the chess world. Very, very few people have uh, have red locks there. <laughs> some people are suggesting maybe a man from the chess press after a bet. He has done a lot of things, of course, growing out his beard until he became. Ah, yeah, that's true. Him. Yeah. No, I would very, very much welcome anyone to uh, <laughs> to try it out. Yeah, but uh, it's a very nice haircut. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. I don't know why, but it doesn't seem so popular in the chess world. There was, of course, back in the day, Grishuk, Alexander Grishuk. He Alexander Grishuk was, looks. of course, yeah, the highest rated and uh, with it. But otherwise, yeah, almost no grandmaster at all, I think. Uh, David uh, Howell has joined us in the chat. He's suggesting ginger dreadlocked GM. Yeah, but... I can ask him about it soon. <laughs> he will be on the show in about 10 minutes, so I can ask him. You will, will have to ask, ask him. Him, the ginger GM himself. What he, but I have a feeling that he would not be so uh, <laughs> enthusiastic about the idea. We shall find out soon. And Niels, those are all the, all the topics I sort of wanted to discuss. Now let's just tell us what's coming up next for you. Um, but there, were, there was a comment in the chat. Uh, in the chat from Arsna Shakayan saying Niels is the best streamer. Niels, get back to streaming. So is that in your plans? We, we will see. I mean, currently and for the foreseeable future, uh, I'm very busy still. I mean, for instance, next week, I don't really have any free days. Uh, and uh, that's how it looks for uh, that's how it's looking for, for a while. But uh, I mean, we don't know now, like with the pandemic situation and so on. Uh, uh, there are no classical tournaments in the foreseeable future. That I think is very unlikely to happen. So it's not impossible once things uh, sort of calms down a bit that uh, that I will go back to it. But uh, for the time being, I still I still don't really have time. So it will have to be uh, it will have to be later in that case. And what is it? I was wondering. So uh, you used to play so much so much chess, and now. You've been branching out a bit, you know, some coaching, some streaming, uh, some other stuff. What is it that you enjoy the most besides besides playing? Uh, I think I, what I enjoy the most, okay, second thing, of course, is uh, the other thing I enjoy very, very much. Uh, but in, yeah, in general, I enjoy working with, uh, with very strong uh, players in any form. Uh, that is, and then whether it's seconding them, having training camps together with them, or if they are maybe slightly weaker to teach them. I mean, I, I like uh, I like it all, but uh, uh, yeah, second in playing, then seconding, then teaching, I think would be the main uh, thing. Uh, and then commentary, of course, also. I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, I, I'm listing all things in chess. <laughs> That's the problem, yeah? Is there, well, then let me ask the question differently. Is there one thing you don't enjoy with in chess? Uh, I, I guess not really. In fact, yeah, no, I, I sort of like uh, like everything, yeah, <laughs> which is good, yeah, because it's my profession. <laughs> very good, very good indeed. And I think that brings me to the end of all the topics I sort of wanted to discuss with you. But Niels, I have prepared a round to to uh, to end this uh, this talk on a fun note. I have prepared a round of very random quick fire questions. You are my first. You're my first guinea pig. I've never done quickfire questions before. So first, I have a, a few completely random, nothing to do with chess. And after that, a round of, uh, of chess-related quickfire questions. And uh -huh. because I'm so generous, I've decided I will give you one pass. So one question I will ask you, you will be allowed to, to pass, to not give an answer. Okay, sure. How does that sound? So, okay, I'll start with the, the general questions, nothing to do with uh, chess. So, if you were an animal, what would you be? Uh, I, don't, I don't actually know what it's called in English, but you know, in, uh, in The Lion King, there is this uh, Timon and Pumbaa, uh -huh. I think they are called in English. <laughs> so, I would like to be the smaller of this, but I don't know what the animal is called. <laughs> Maybe someone in the chat can help us out. You know, they are, then, you know, running around singing, <laughs> dancing, yeah, and uh, not really caring. Uh, so so that uh, one, one of those I would like to be, or I think I would be. Excellent. I like the answer. It wasn't, we're not yet uh, there with the quick fire, but I'm sure someone would tell us. 
They are apparently a meerkat and a warthog. So the meerkat, you want to be a meerkat? Meerkat, yeah, yeah, meerkat, meerkat, yes. <laughs> okay, next question. Which superpower would you like to have? Uh, which superpower? I don't know. No, I would like to fly. That would be nice. <laughs> That's good. If you had a time machine, where and when would you go? So which area, which, which place? Uh, I'd go to the 70s, maybe 67. I mean, during the Fisher era. That sounds exciting. Maybe to Reykjavik for the match? Yeah, exactly. Reykjavik <laughs> could be nice. Um, which three people would you invite to dinner? Mm. Maybe Bob Marley could be nice, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, maybe uh, I don't know some other. Uh, uh, this maybe Gandhi <laughs> could be interesting, and one more, Oof, some uh, maybe Fisher, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fisher, Gandhi, and Bob Marley. I like it. Um, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram? Uh, Twitter. Favorite movie? Uh, the Triplets of Belleville. Favorite artist? Uh, Peter Tosh. Favorite song? Uh, favorite song? Scatman's World. Favorite food? Uh, burger. Favorite drink? Uh, coffee. And uh, favorite subject in school? Mm, physical education. And favorite sport besides chess? Uh, table tennis. Describe yourself in three words. Uh, happy, uh, impatient, <laughs> and uh, I don't know, clowny. <laughs> what is the compliment you receive the most? Uh, that I'm always in a good mood. <laughs> the last book you've read. The last book, uh, The Beekeeper of Aleppo, actually. Very interesting. And finally, your best quality. Best quality? Yeah, your best quality. I don't know. Uh, probably, again, um, positiveness, positivity. Excellent. Those are some good answers, and you haven't used your pass yet. So now we move on. Uh, to the chess related, the chess related questions. Sure. Which opening will you never play? Uh, the bone cloud. <laughs> Which chess player would you take with you on a desert island? Uh, my girlfriend. <laughs> that was too easy. Besides Ellen. <laughs> Besides Ellen. Uh huh. Uh... <laughs> I heard Sam Shanklin was in some sort of survival program, so maybe him. <laughs> Sam Shanklin. And who is the one player you, you did not want to be stranded with? Oof, I, this I will pause. I cannot <laughs> answer such. Which, uh, which one word describes you as a player? Uh, uh, one word. I don't know. Quick fire. <laughs> Quick fire. Okay. Uh, theoretical. <laughs> uh, your favorite chess streamer. Streamer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, is this a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> it was actually it was a question which was suggested to be my uh, by a viewer. Favorite streamer besides I don't count. I'm not involved. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, streamer, I don't know, I like Fiddler. Fiddler, 
Which player's prep would you steal if you could? A prep? Yeah. Uh, if you could hack their computers. If I could hack their computer, Karan, I would say. And which player would you ask for opening advice in general? Uh, in general, uh, probably uh, Petter Heine Nielsen. And uh, your favorite Twitter account to follow? Favorite Twitter account to follow? Uh, I would say uh, God. <laughs> this was for the chest. <laughs> okay, God. And ah, this... for the chest. Ah, it must be chess. Uh, but God, I should add it, the, the Twitter account to the general questions as well. <laughs> I don't I have mean, a favorite Twitter account for chess. Uh, well, I'd say Peter Heine Nielsen again. <laughs> Always some controversy there. <laughs> He's very active on Twitter as well. He's very so he's... active, yeah, and also always with something uh, very controversial. Yeah, it's very nice to follow. Um, classical rapid blitz or bullet? Mm, classical for myself. Your favorite world champion? Um, I guess Magnus Carlsen. What would you be if not a chess player? Actually, that's not really a chess question, but... Kind what of. would... Who, whom I would be? What you would be? What would you do professionally? Ah, what I would do professionally? Uh, I don't know, probably probably study somewhere in some university, maybe <laughs> teaching. And uh, your greatest achievement in chess? Greatest achievement? Uh, I, I was uh, sharing first in European individual, actually, last year. That's, yeah, that, and you came so close. I remember I was waiting for you. And finally, last question. What would you name your opening if you invented one? Uh, the <laughs> Grand Delicious line. <laughs> I like it. Okay, you've done actually, you did really, really well on the quick fire question. So kudos, kudos for that. I have two more questions from viewers. And now is also the time, if you're watching us in the chat, I'm reading the Twitch chat. If you have any final questions uh, for Niels, now is your time to ask them. So first question, uh, there's a question from Mary Pan that she asked already yesterday. If you had only 30 min minutes per day to work on chess, those are not quick for you anymore, by the way, we're done yeah, with it. Yeah. If you had only the 30 minutes per day to work on chess, what would you do? And it's, I don't think it's you personally, but in general, what's your advice? If people had only 30 minutes a day, what should they do? I would solve exercises. For sure. You do this on a daily on a daily basis. I do this on a regular basis. Yeah, I think it's very useful. And uh, the second question that we had was in your opinion does playing a lot of blitz and bullet chess make uh, your chess deteriorate in the long run? Uh, well, bullet I don't really know and blitz for sure not. I think blitz is a very useful tool for uh, improving. As long as you stay uh, focused and you play against strong opponents. Uh, How do you use actually the online? You said you well, you play quite a bit of online bits, not as much as maybe Ali Reza. So much yeah, as... no, I I don't play as much as I would would like to even because I'm busy doing other things. But uh, uh, I no, I, I I try to play and I am trying to participate in the tournaments that are there when they are strong. Uh, and yeah, no, I mean, when I play casual games, I, I just try to play maybe not too many at a time and try to keep focus and, uh, I mean, actually, actually do my best. And you, and as long as you do that, I think, I think it's a very reasonable way of trying to improve. Yeah, was it not Anish who advocated playing a lot of blitz? I, I think so, yeah. And he was not, uh, like, uh, let's say, traditionally one of the big adherents of blitz in general, mm. so... If, when even Anish says that it's good for you, then then it must be, I think. Absolutely. Passpon wants to know, you were talking about puzzles, uh, solving puzzles. What kind of puzzles do you, um, what kind of puzzles would you advise to solve in those 30 allocated minutes? I think it doesn't actually matter that much. I think um, almost all sorts of puzzles are, are good. Uh, I mean, tactics, short tactics, deeper tactics. But also strategic exercises, positional exercises, I mean studies, uh, uh, and any kind of exercise where you are sort of uh, uh, using your brain and having to make decisions, I think is very, very useful. 
And then I think a final question from working class heroes. Uh, what's the most fun part of just openings, middle games or end games? I definitely uh, enjoy openings the most personally. I mean, I'm also a sort of uh, uh, a second on uh, quite regularly. So it, it's clear that for me personally, it's, it's definitely openings. Uh, for others, it's other things for sure. How much in your, when you work on chess at home, how much of, in terms of percentage, how much of it goes to, to openings, would you say? Oh, it's, it's very difficult to say, but maybe half, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Very difficult to say, though. Uh, maybe a bit less than half, but around there. There is a couple of more questions coming. Albinini, is the Torrid just a better London? No, I don't think so. I think they are of equal, similar value. <laughs> and Maripant, to close this off, uh, do you have any chessable courses coming? Uh, for the time being, no. Uh, on the other hand, I have a uh, coaches uh, training uh, weekend, or uh, I'm not sure what the proper ter term is. Boot camp, I think it's called, uh, the, which will be at the start of the, uh, in the start of December. Uh, that that I have, and uh, but generally speaking, yeah, I'm working more sort of directly, uh, uh, like with uh, with an audience or with a student or, or something like that. So. Uh, that that I enjoy a lot, but uh, chessable course, no, not not currently. Would you be interested in doing one? Uh, I, I guess so. I, I don't really know how how it works, but uh, it could it could definitely be uh, be something. I haven't really tried to do any any like writing any books or making any video course or a series and so on. Uh, could be. Could be. Be for sure. I haven't really been offered either, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if there is any interest. So. <laughs> Jessabel, if you're listening, and of course, well, this show here is powered by coaches.com, so there's going to be a lot of boot camps coming. I, I think the next one is uh, with John, John Bartholomew. Um, and, uh, and, there's, and Niels, I think that's going to be it uh, for me because I've just been told that I only have 30 for me, 35 minutes for the show. So I'm going to bring on uh, Simon. We started it a bit late, but Niels, thank you so much uh, for your time. I think some very interesting uh, answers, some very interesting stuff in there. And uh, we'd love to have you back another time. Best of luck with everything uh, that's coming up for you. And I'm sure we'll hear more from you soon. Yeah, thank you very much. You too. And thank you for everyone who listened. I hope you had a, had an interesting time or an entertaining time at least. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Neil, so see much. See you around, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so that was Niels Grandelius, everyone. Um, a really, really fascinating character, a lovely person and a great chess player, of course. And we're now Without much further ado, I'm going to try and call up Simon. Um, probably we will try and have Simon. <laughs> Apologies about the... <laughs> Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Let me just sort out your, um, your camera. Hmm. I, can, I can hear you. People can hear you. Uh, just they cannot see you yet, but they, can, they will be able to see you in just just a second while I make sure that your camera is fixed and it is it is fixed let me just there we go no nope. now we have to move our cameras a tiny bit so Simon hi how are you doing right long time no speak how are you doing yeah I'm doing all right not too bad I um, was just listening to Niels there um, very interesting to listen to him and yourself, of course. Nelly's I was hoping you weren't going to be listening because now you already have prepared all your quickfire answers. I, I only got the last couple of minutes and they seemed a bit intense, some of those questions. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to drink my whiskey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway. Cheers to that. I'm on the water tonight, but I'll be cheering, cheering to you. Yeah. So, Simon, tell us. Yes. What have you been up to the last few months? Um, well, quite a lot of things, really. I mean, I heard Neil's talking about chess, Chessable. So I've been doing uh, a lot of work for Chessable, uh, many, many courses and building courses up. So that's been one big thing. Um, 
some ginger gem stuff, of course. So, mm-hmm. like, you know, trying to keep that thing going. And, uh, yeah, just, just bits and bobs like that, really. I mean, not as much streaming as I want to do. Um, so I'd like to get back into that. But, yeah, it's all, it's all been okay. It's been busy, which is good. It's good to be busy. Absolutely. Yeah. And just before we move on, people in the chat are compl- a lot of compliments for your beard, Simon. How, do you. You, how do you maintain <laughs> this uh, wonder of a ginger beard? Virgin's blood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, just 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 beard oil, uh, really. Um, like uh, I I don't know. I mean, I, I really wanted to grow it like this long, but I think it's got to its maximum length now. So uh, which which is a pity, you know. I'd love to have it. I'd love to have it flowing down here, but for it, Christmas. It, it, well, just in general, why not? You know, but it, it's not going any further, unfortunately. I would so, love to uh, see yeah. you as a ginger yeah. ginger Santa or something like that. Well, it's going the right way there, shall we say. <laughs> I've definitely got the right ho-ho around the midways going, especially with this COVID. And yeah, yeah, so that that's going well. I'm training up in the mid area uh, extremely well. So we'll, just <laughs> so. Have to, we'll just have to get working on, on the beard. Oh, yeah, before mm. I move on, uh, I don't know if you caught, but Niels and I were discussing his dreadlocks. And David yeah. Howell, who's in the chat, was suggesting that maybe you could be the next the next GM uh sporting dreadlocks what do you think well it's funny i i, I when i was younger um i i actually was very tempted to try and grow dreadlocks but that was that was in my you know reggae days <laughs> <laughs> my bob marley days man and um you know um but it, i never my hair never really quite got to any length <laughs> i i always got annoyed with my hair and just ended up like shaving it off or something so uh it, okay. i'm afraid it would it's have been quite the look. It would have been interesting, yeah. <laughs> Simon, I don't what? know. Can you see the? Can you see the stream? Can you see? Because I just pulled up the art of attack. I can. And I can see it. Yeah. You can yeah. see it. Okay, so yeah. I have prepared two things. I hope this is going to work because it's the only video I have prepared for tonight. So wish me luck. Okay. But I'm okay. gonna try and show one of the favorite things that I have seen on Twitter in recent months yeah and here we go hopefully people can hear have you ever met miss lindy she's a gal with the bright red hair now she stands high from all the fresh you know her So Simon, I think I tweeted at the time that I think this is one of my favorite things that I have ever seen on Twitter. <laughs> what did you think? Who's I- First of all, whose idea was this uh, trailer for your Iron English? I'm certainly not mine. <laughs> and um, I mean, one, one of the one of the fun things, like you know, obviously Chessboard's quite a new company, but uh, what I found working with them is. Uh, they they have so many cool ideas and not like you know they're quite unique to any other company they they have so many people doing so many different stuff and i have to say this idea was down to um string dog um is his twitter handle lewis mm-hmm. and uh he 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 did this in another another trailer and he, he's brilliant at coming up with some whacked out ideas um him and uh gertz um who who's you know my main point contact in chessball but they always come up with these messed up ideas and i'm like you want me to buy a what i need to buy an iron and an ironing board i've never i, I was I wondering even, actually was I, this I, yours what? like because i, I saw some I, people I, on twitter comment like simon surely has never ironed anything in yeah, his I, life my first question was, "What is an iron? I, what is an iron? I don't know. Is that, is what, I have no idea what an iron is. So I had to go, I had to go to Sainsbury's and buy an iron, an ironing board, 
during lockdown for the first time ever and i'm like what am i doing is my life going this direction now so uh so that was that was a bit odd so i haven't used it since i've only that's used that's it that my trailer. next question actually. yeah no i haven't used it since it's a, it's a one-off it's a one-off <laughs> <laughs> so oh. amadan is in the chat he's wondering uh was it blair who was directing the video was blair involved in any way uh no it's my, my girlfriend was was uh film, filming that one k so uh yeah Basically. It's a great, so, it's a great, yeah. I think it's a fantastic yeah. trailer. How happy were you with how it, how it came out? I was reasonably happy. I realized I, I need to do some more press ups <laughs> afterwards, but apart from that, I was, apart from that, I was quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, but yeah, no, it's cool. It's cool. It's all fun. So yeah. <laughs> so, and it seems like, so, uh, so we saw the Iron English on the screen. We have the Art of Attack. Of course, there was the Dutch, there was the Jabava London. Uh, Amadan is asking, is the Black Lion course out on Chessable? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, uh, the Black Lion was the second course I did. Um, How many have I you mean, done, actually? So I, we did the Jabava London first, then we did the Black Lion. No, sorry, the Dutch first. Let me get this right. The Dutch, Jabava London, Black Lion. I did the videos for the Art of the Attack and just this English one. Um, so they're all the reason I've done them so far is they're they're all openings I've played and have mm -hmm. had a big effect on my life. Um, so the English I played all the way to get to I am strength and the other ones I play quite regularly. So uh, hence why I suggested them. And also I thought they'd be very good openings for players out there who want to learn something. And I try to cover D4, E4, with each of these separate things. So uh, so yeah, so the black black line is is certainly been done as well as all those other ones as well. So all cool, yeah. Great. And Maripan, for example, in the chat is saying she has all your courses. I know people have, oh, uh, thank you. have thank loved you. them. Yeah. I am yet to watch. I am still still have on my bucket list to watch the, the Dutch <laughs> DVD. Yeah, whatever, whatever, <laughs> whatever. This is quite a funny story, actually. Like, um, I think about 20 years ago or something, uh, Fiona says, oh, you know, I, I want to learn an opening. I said, well, you can, you can have my, you know, I'll give it to you for free. My Dutch DVD. She said, oh, yeah, that'd be fantastic. I'll definitely watch that and study all of that. So I sent it over to her. And um, 20 years later, <laughs> I, I don't even I don't even know she's downloaded it yet. I very much doubt it. So, it's somewhere uh, as a zip file on my computer. <laughs> oh, oh, well done. But Progress. <laughs> on the bright side, I have never um, I have never watched any chess <laughs> course. So yours will be the first. When I watch one, yours will be the first time. I was wondering, out of all the courses that you made for Chessable, do you have a favorite one? Um. Not really. Um, I, I enjoyed doing them. I enjoyed them all in different ways, I suppose. Um, I guess I guess the Dutch is sort of close to my heart, the first one. But in actual fact, I was that was a bit of a pain to prepare because it was it was the hardest one. It's quite deep variations. So not really. I don't really have a favorite one. They, they've all got strengths, I feel, in different ways. So, yeah. Let's talk. Yeah, I mean, I think people should just should just get them all and make uh, make up their minds themselves. I was actually I, I completely forgot. I wanted to prepare a photo of the Ginger GM, uh, your logo. But let me ask you while I pull something up from Ginger GM, uh, how did the company and also the, the name Ginger GM, how did that all come about? I'm um, well, all, all my best ideas and worst ideas in life have originated in the pub and uh, the ginger gem was no different i was i was in the pub with um uh, gary o'grady and i think simon answer i can't even remember because i was drunk and um it actually came about like i, I went to chess space and i said uh, you know can you, do you can i record a video for you ages ago and they said nah you know basically you're too crap we don't know you and i kind of thought well sod you i'm gonna make my own company and uh, I'll do it myself then so um obviously after a couple of beers and um yeah so we just we just started doing it so we got a cameraman who very entertaining chap and we filmed down the bottom of his garden in a shed um and uh, kind of went from there really so it was yeah it was all, all a bit of fun and uh, it has been it has been throughout throughout the you know educational fun I think how long ago was, was that when was when was ginger GM born? 12 years ago, maybe roughly something like that, I guess something like 12 years ago. Yeah, a while back now. So crazy. Yeah. And yeah. so before before the company was created, Ginger GM wasn't even a nickname like 
the right. who who came first, the nickname or the company? Um, well, I think the idea for the company came first, and it, it was just like you know, it sounded like a good idea, quite fun to do. I think my strengths always been like presentation in that way, so mm -hmm. it, it made sense to use my strengths in a way that. I could pass the love of chess over and hopefully make a, a little bit of money to survive as well. So yeah, so the the idea came first, and then and then the name after. You know, you got to, you got to brainstorm, and the pub is perfect for that. I mean, I'm not saying all business is taken down the pub, but brainstorming, get the creative juices going, it, it certainly helps. I think. Well, my yeah. my Fionketa idea, my Fionketa handle, I I followed your lead, and also the pub is where where it was born. Simon, yeah. uh. Uh, well, people should for sure check out gingergm.com and also your courses on Chessable. And the next thing I wanted to discuss with you is, uh, of course, the one thing that has been all the rage and all the talk uh, these last few days. It is The Queen's Gambit. Uh, just came out on Netflix just two days ago. So nice and fresh. And I know that you have already watched the whole thing. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I, I, I watched it over the last two days. And um, first of all, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, like a, a ginger headed grandmaster who drinks and pops lots of pills and stuff. And no, it was great. I mean, it, it was it, it's a great book. And they brought the book to life. Uh, in some ways, I think, you know, normally a transition from book to screen doesn't work so well but in 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 this time it worked really well and i think actually they they've out you know really done a great job and the actress is you know stunning a stunning actress um as yeah and it, it's just really cool it's really yeah. cool everyone should go and watch it basically i was yeah. going to i was actually going to show your own tweet but then i heard that you got some People were not happy with you, happy with you spoiling, <laughs> spoiling things from them. So instead, I, I found this tweet by the New York, uh, the New York Times arts, and even apparently Gary Kasparov has given his seal of approval, uh, saying that it comes as close as possible to the authentic atmosphere of chess tournaments. How much do you agree with that? I, by the way, don't spoil anything. I'm only one episode in, so I will be watching it soon, but. Uh, how much did you think that uh, the movie did justice to the chess world? Yeah, I mean, a lot. I mean, I heard that um, Gary Kasparov was one of the guys who advised on the chess scenes. And um, I, I, I think... I have not heard that. Interesting. I, th I think he advised. And uh, I think compared to any other chess thing that I've watched, and I've probably watched all the chess movies you can think of, uh, you know, Porn, Sacrifice, all that, I think the chess scenes in Queen's Gambit were more deeply researched mm -hmm. than anything else as in the positions i think nearly all arose from games quite obscure games and they all had very interesting uh points to them so you could spend a lot of time just looking at the positions and working them out so the, the one thing which you've probably seen in, in in the first scene i won't give anything away the first one is just that you know my little 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 uh not negative but is the way they move the pieces <laughs> you know they're very like Whoa! you know and they stare at their opponent like this <laughs> <laughs> you know and it, you know it's obviously dramatic and yeah. uh, that's the thing but it, it's great yeah i mean it's really the research has been done with it so there's a lot of great chess stuff going in there and i think actually yeah. we can we can give a, a shout out to our good friend uh, ingvar from iceland aka yeah, Zip, zibit i think he has started just earlier i actually saw it just before going live so he has started on his youtube uh, channel a series where he depicts all the chess uh, games and scenes uh, from from the series. So he analyzes and he, you know, sort of tells you more about uh, which games those were. So definitely worth checking out if you uh, if you have an interest. And I also saw that Gary Gary Kasparov uh, tweeted himself upon the release. So the original tweet was by the English Chess Federation. Um, uh, quoting the main, the lead actress, uh, Anya Taylor-Joy, who was saying that she got invited into a very secret world that is super cool and really interesting. And Gary uh, Kasparov tweeted, we have been saying chess is cool for years and how he was already, you know, uh, saying this 20 years ago, he was already using some chess lights. So do you think, Simon, that, uh, that Queen's Gambit is going to help, is going to help uh, popularize chess even more. I think chess has already made huge steps 
uh, in the last few years, but how much do you think Queen's Gambit is going to, to help us going forward? Yeah, I mean, it's a very exciting time for chess in general. I mean, um, you know, obviously COVID's horrible, but, you know, chess has, has always pros and cons. Chess has been booming. Um, and I think just generally the whole perception in some countries, I'm not going to say all countries, uh, that chess is not cool and, it, and it's for geeks is, is quite a weird perception. I mean, people who say that are generally uh, um, people who have no idea uh, about what the chess life's like and they just assume you know everyone doesn't have a life who plays chess etc and they're very geeky but geeky is quite cool you know they haven't I mean, seen you simon <laughs> they haven't met you well well maybe yeah and and also just being intellectually smart and using your brain for a living i mean i'm sure most of the people who say this end up doing jobs that are not very desirable and geeky is cool look at all the geeks look at the the microsoft people of the world and it's a cool thing you know they're the guys who're going to lead the world the geeks in the end and i, I think the whole point of it being geeky is i don't even know what geeky means but it's certainly not a bad thing using your brain in a creative way is only a positive thing so and i think this this show queen's gambit has shown it, it can be quite sexy as well so which is uh, yeah which is also good absolutely so, i see that uh, laura in the in the chat is uh, she was wondering whether it was worth watching but i mean you have seen it all so you're a better place but I, i've just seen one episode but i really loved it and i thought the photography was really stunning um and yeah i think definitely highly recommend it yeah i mean if you have any interest in chess then you have to watch it even if you're not interested in chess you you you, have, you probably should watch it as well because it's uh it, it's it's fantastic i mean i i can't really criticize it at all i mean the act the actors actress the main actress fantastic and yeah everything's good so yeah, yeah don't watch I, I also, it i also found yeah. that compared to i think that we as chess players i don't know if you will agree with this i think hope probably you will agree but i think very often when we see movies or series uh that are about chess i often find it quite cringy you know the chess scenes like everything like even i haven't seen so many but even pawn sacrifice and a cringy yeah. and b there's often so many mistakes <laughs> it's already good if they get the the h1 uh, corner color right but i think yeah. here as you said you know the research has been done and uh, and i think it's a show that's really going to to appeal to both um chess players yeah. and non-chess players i've heard of a lot of people you know have yeah. who have partners or friends who are not chess players who've been enjoying yeah. it do, do you know I, I was actually thinking of a script for, for a chess film um again down the pub but um <laughs> do you want to hear my do you want to hear my script of course <laughs> well i had two ideas one was a bit like peep show very famous english comedy with two struggling chess professionals who are sharing a flat in London and they're trying to make they're trying to make their living from playing chess. Thought that's my ideas. The other one was a, a a proper Hollywood film about a murderer and he murders on in London. And what he does, you used to have the A to Z. Don't know if anyone can remember that in the old days. It's a map which has A to Z. And he murdered on certain squares, like E4 would be his first murder. And then he'd, then he'd murder on C5. And uh, it would go on like this. And then the detective basically comes along and thinks, oh, he's a chess player, a bit like a Raymond King, you know, who apparently is very good at that. And he said, oh, he, he puts the dots together. And then Lorendo comes along, the super detective, and solves it all. Simon, anyway. I see that the lockdown has gotten uh, your creative <laughs> juices flowing. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you, uh, Danny. Uh, hello, Danny. Hope you're doing all right, mate. And I don't uh, hello, think, is that Killian. Danny? Danny Dorelli. Uh, pr probably was. There were actually, I think it was a murderer in Russia who did that. But I thought, you know, some London A to Z murder mystery would be would be quite cool. Anyway, yeah. Sorry. If you had yeah. to put some chess players okay. into the the role, the the leading role of your your chess movie fantasies who would you put out of the who would Ooh. be your picks in the chess world well i did like the idea of lorendel thomas rendel because it just sounds good you know like lorendel it's got that nice exotic kind of name to it you know this this super sherlock holmes character and his his sidekick could be you know someone else um but i don't, I don't know maybe you could have the murderer who would the murder i don't know there's who so would the many murderer be? 
there's so many great characters in the chess world that uh you know just 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 basing it on someone would be half the fun i think um yeah it could be could be quite cool i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Simon, and before we move, I mean, I would love to. I hope there's some producers out there watching and thinking, yeah, let's hit up oh. Simon and make it happen. Oh. And before we move on from from the Queen's Gambit, uh, is there any other chess-related movies or series that you liked or that you would recommend? Um, well, like I say I've seen most of them. Um, they, I think they've all been pretty average, to be honest. Um, uh, I remember searching for Bobby Fischer I saw as a kid was okay, you know, as a kid it was great, but uh, the Bobby Fischer film, Porn Sacrifice, I enjoyed, it, it was, you know, but uh, it, it was enjoyable, I think, that's about it. Um, just some, like, more dodgy stuff uh, I, I've seen, and uh, um, but nothing really that amazing, nothing up to the level of Queen's, Queen's Gambit anyway, so, yeah. yeah. An absolute must watch. I have to say it in the chat. Everyone is talking about Lawrence Trent. So if Trent, Lawrence <laughs> Trent was in your movie, which role would you, would you give him? Well, I think Baku's has got it right. He'd, he'd have to be the first person murdered <laughs> in some grisly way in, in a London bar. You know, just like, you know, a Jack the Ripper scene. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but I have thought about it, Lawrence. Sorry to say that. No, I love Lawrence. I'm, Shout I'm out only, to I'm, our I'm, good I'm, friend, Lawrence Trent. <laughs> I'm only joking, of course. I, I don't know. I mean, it'd just be fun to, you know, kill off some chess players. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I might have to rethink. This show has got night of control. I might have to rethink. Rethink yeah. the concept for future weeks. Simon, yeah. let's move on to another topic made the headlines uh, in the last, well, when it was announced, so almost 10 days ago, FIDE announced that uh, the candidates tournament, which had been supposed to resume, I think one week from now on 1st November, was postponed until the spring of 2021. So first of all, uh, how much of a surprise, how, for how much of a surprise this is, did it come to you? I think it was about as surprising as the the sun rising tomorrow. You know, it was like, uh, it, I mean, of course, it's not surprising the way things are going. I mean, I think, you know, the whole thing's the whole thing's been a bit strange. Um, I can understand why they did the first tournament. I could. There's lots of different views with, uh, you know, uh, Rajabov um, pulling out, but then MVL getting a place. He should have had probably had a place anyway. Um, but I, I think trying to run the candidates this year was just probably a ridiculous decision. Maybe they can do it as Norway have done their tournament, but there's so many players in different parts of the world and they need to prepare. They need lots of time to prepare. And it's the biggest tournament of the year. I mean, it's, it's an impossible situation. Mm. Like, so I think any decision made is going to have uh, pros and cons, whatever happens, basically. If you yeah. were a betting man, which you are not, of course, uh, what would no. you do, say are the odds of the tournament taking place uh, in spring 2021? Um, well, I, I think it's I think it's definitely possible. I mean, if they if I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, they, they can try. I mean, I, I, it, the thing is, when's the World Championships going to be? That, that's the other problem, because if it takes place in spring, and the World Championships, I don't know when that's due to be played. You've got to have, you've got to make sure there's enough time. It's just, it's just really hard. I mean, I suppose they've got to try to do it in spring to get the World Championships done. But what happens if some of the players don't want to play? Uh, and it's, it's really hard. I don't think there's a, an answer. I think they have to try to put it in spring and then see how things go. It is maybe the right way to do it. Absolutely. Well, what you, you have just, uh, what you have just talked about brings me to the next point. Maybe the. <laughs> The most difficult thing will not just be to find a venue and to guarantee the the good playing conditions, but what might be the most difficult is to satisfy um, all the players and their demands. So next up uh, is something which I think was publicly discussed and um, posted elsewhere. So it's not like I'm revealing any private information here, but it is a, a screenshot from Wang Hao's uh, Facebook page who um, who expressed his disappointment. Uh, so he says, I received such a reply after saying that I am not satisfied with the proposals. This was just before it was, can uh, 10 days before it was cancelled. After saying that I am not satisfied with the proposals by FIDE when we are discussing about the second leg of the candidates tournament. And then he attached a screenshot 
of an email by the FIDE president, uh, Arkady Drokovic, saying, Dear How, do I understand your last message correctly? You do not want to play in the candidates anymore, or I misunderstood it. Shall we take it as if you just wish to play next door to your apartment, or you think about reasonable and feasible solutions as well? Best, Arkady. Simon, what did you make of that? I'm, well, there's a couple of things I, I, I think. I mean, for the first thing I'd like to say is I have utmost respect for Wang Hao. He's a great player and he seems like a gentleman and just a nice chap. Um, but I don't know, this must have been a last resort posting that. I think posting private messages is, is something which is really a last resort, uh, especially, you know, it, it, in some ways it seems a breach of confidence. And, I, I, you know, I know that he did this because he's probably frustrated and because of Arcadi's tone. If this was Arcadi's message, it, it does read as being extremely rude, I have to say, and blunt, without much much care. So maybe Wang Hao was so surprised he thought he should post it. Um, and it just seems a lot of, lot of frustration, frustration going on here, as in, obviously, Wang Hao's very concerned, understandably, and Arcadi's trying to get the tournament going, un understandably, and they're in kind of a stalemate position, if you like. And the frustration is sort of coming across there in that email. So I think uh, I think obviously if you read it as it is, it's bad. But um, I think posting something like that should try to be avoided as much as possible as well. Really, you know. Yeah. I think it's an interesting discussion actually. I, I followed this at the time, so I would not have shown it if it hadn't been. Uh, it was posted on on various social medias uh, at the time. And there was a big uh, big discussion about should this have been published at all or not. I mean, also the fact that I just screenshot this today, so Wang Hao never uh, took it down. So I think he still stands behind his decision. But I think Peter mm -hmm. Heine Nielsen was actually one of the advocates for uh, that you that it is your right to, to publish publications um, which are within organizations. So I think he was arguing that this is a communication um that it is like an official organization rather than a, a private exchange so he was one of the people who was advocated for there were others against but yeah, yeah. i think it's, it's a really tough one because i can see uh mar pant saying yeah it, it should be made public and I, I do agree with that as well um obviously if it was supposed to be an official thing and it's a public statement and that that changes things a lot rather than part of a longer communication because we don't know i don't know the communication before that which Actually, i mean maybe it's out there i mean i'm not i'm not very well known yeah, it'd be nice to see the whole communication just make that clear so yeah. basically one of the first answers was uh, saying um oh you shouldn't post this without saying what was your last email so he actually uh, published the whole <laughs> the whole email Aha. exchanges okay. leading leading okay. up to this one everything yeah. okay well, yeah i didn't realize that i mean it, it's Things should be, I mean, in some cases, if things are going so bad, they should be made public, definitely. So I can see both sides' story and sides of this, but it, it, it's a little bit dangerous, um, you know, the concept of if it is a private, it depends if it's supposed to be a private email or not, because suddenly if, you know, you, you feel like it's okay to make public a, a private email because it suits your agenda is, is a dangerous one in general, um, just, just, I think, in the normal sense of the world. Um, but I can understand why it's done here. So, I, I, you know, it's, a, again, a very tricky situation. Yeah, it's a very so. tricky, especially because Wan Hao was the one player, of course, who was the most outspoken since the start. He really did not yeah. want the tournament today to take place. So it's a it's a very, a very uh, tricky situation. And then someone else got involved. Uh, let me remove these two or not involved. He gave an interview. And this is a statement. I should probably have written it down. Let me add some quick text, see if I can do that. You know, Simon, that I'm not the best the best producer, but I will try. You're doing a great job. I will Fantastic. try my best. So now yeah. there is some text on the screen. Let's just try and okay. So for sure. people who are just joining us now, this is a, a quote by Grishog, and it is taken from uh, an interview which was uh, transcribed or translated uh, by Colin on the Chess24 website, so you can find you can find it there. And basically, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but uh, Grishog was expla um, expressing his doubts that the, the problem is 
that FIDE are gonna struggle to satisfy all the participants. So Wang Hao made it clear that I think he is very wary about playing. I think he said until there is a vaccine. I think he would like for there to be a vaccine before the tournament uh, resumes. And Grishuk, on the other hand, and I quote, he says, I am ready to play, so to speak, in a garage, a basement, a zoo or a train station. I don't need any kind of medical insurance, luxury hotels and comfortable conditions for holding the event. And then he goes on to say that, however, he will not sit in a quarantine for two weeks or to, you know, be like in this bubble where he is not allowed to leave the hotel or playing in a mask and gloves. Um, And so he concludes, and how in such a situation can you satisfy both me and the other players? if we have exactly the opposite demands. So what do you think? What do you think about Wisher's statement? Well, I think it, uh, it also makes sense. I mean, you're saying, should this tournament happen next year? My gut feeling really is that they, they should just do it. They should just run it, get it over with. It's not going to be ideal. Um, it won't, everyone's not going to be happy whatever they do. I mean, this, this is an impossible situation and, and you probably shouldn't, well, you should try to make everyone happy if you're fee day, but if it's impossible to do, you just have to go ahead with it. So I think uh, I think this point of view makes makes a lot of sense. You know, people are going to be uh, annoyed, so just do it. Um, I think on the broader note of, of, of people's decisions, if they play or not, it's obviously a, a lifetime opportunity. And if they don't play in it, then it's it's certainly should be not criticized for their judgment and i think that goes for any decision nowadays about working abroad uh about anything like that i mean you know we don't really know what's happening still with everything and uh, uh people's personal decisions shouldn't be criticized at this moment in time in an unknown unknown world uh situation but um i think i think it will just have to come down to maybe what chris Chuk is saying just just do it everyone's not going to be happy get it over with it's not going to be perfect but let's just let's just do it anyway, kind of thing. That that kind of makes the most sense in a very tricky position, I guess. But again, maybe things will change by spring, in a, in a great way. Who knows? Yeah, we yeah. will. Time will tell. I think it's such an just such an unpredictable time that who knows what will what will be in spring. But I was wondering, do you know? And this is not a question. I don't actually know the answer. Maybe you do, or maybe someone in the chat. But if the tournament does resume in uh, in may uh, in spring that would there will have been one year between the the start uh, of the tournament and the completion so is this the longest a big sporting event has ever been put on hold i was wondering well quite quite possibly yeah i mean if uh, if it is a sporting event it's not in some countries i guess but um yeah i mean i, I imagine so i mean I, I guess with the war uh, some of the wars must have delayed uh, tournaments from going ahead for for quite a long time. I mean, but delayed. Um, but were they? Do you think there's any that were started, and then? Oh, any that started and that was stopped. I mean, maybe with the outbreak of a war somewhere, yeah. a tournament was started and it, it was completed another time. Um, but I, you know, I I I, I don't know the history. It's, it's weird times, isn't it, at the moment? Very, very strange. Very yeah. weird times indeed. There was a question in the chat a minute ago. So when? And if if and when the tournament does resume, who is your favourite to win it? I uh, well, I think it's it's going to be a totally different tournament. I mean, <laughs> that's that's the weird thing with this because you know, <laughs> know it, it it's had as you say it's had this long break, so it's a complete gamble in in a lot of ways. I mean, I I I think it's impossible to say. I mean, um, I mean, if you're going with what what happened in the first tournament, you probably have to say MVL or Nepo. Uh, who played fantastically, but they might come to this tournament different people. Um, I, I, I would, I'd like to say MVL, but it, I think anyone can still do, you know, do the job, depending on circumstances. It's yeah. interesting because it feels like I can barely even remember the first part of the tournament. Like it course, feels yeah. like it happened so long ago. It was another world, so yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, it yeah. would be very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, to see to see what yeah. happens with that so yeah. i see in the in the chat marathon is a controversial subject so yeah that's also a bit what i mean i want to i don't want to create controversy with the show but i think one of my goals also going forward this will hopefully be a weekly show i think it's very interesting to to hear your intake uh, your take on things neil's earlier 
and sort of just create create a, a discussion also it's interesting to see what the chat thinks as always and yeah sort of that's where i'm headed with the show it's only the first one so i'm only finding my footing but i think we had some some interesting discussions uh there so simon tell me now uh more about yourself what's coming up for you in the in these coming months what are your plans um well i don't know just keep keep working away um i'm gonna probably just keep with the chess ball work which i really enjoy doing try to spread a bit of that chess love um i'd like to find a bit more time to do a bit more of my youtube channel um got some quite cool ideas for that but it, it's just time and um yeah just just keep doing the things and uh chess wise just just really doing what i'm doing i guess you know so yeah nothing too different there were a lot of people of course in the chat who were saying they love your streams and you haven't been streaming quite as much can we expect more streams or what are your what are your feelings on that well i, I think it's like neil's uh, it's just finding the time i mean streaming can be great fun but it, it as, as you know fiona it's it's uh hard work and it doesn't you know always pay the bills so it's more of a luxury kind of thing which i'm sure we all like doing so i, I would like to if i can find the time uh, to to do it and uh, it's also i mean for me i i find like it's nice to try out new things so i'd like to sort of you know try something different in the stream not do the same thing every time so uh, I'd, I'd like to maybe come up with some new new ideas if i was gonna if for the future streaming yeah maybe, <laughs> maybe maybe play like i don't know maybe play uh Monopoly or something. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was gonna. That was my next question. Have you um, have you gotten any new hobbies during this pandemic? What have you been up to? Anything new uh, outside um, outside of chess? Not really. Um, which is kind of a pity. I mean, I, I started off pretty well by actually getting out on the mountain bike a bit but that went to that went to crap and uh, i just <laughs> sat around eating and drinking instead so um you, you know um i'm going to try to change that again now but nothing really nothing nothing too much different i mean it's given me more time to concentrate on some of the chess things at home that i've wanted to do like these chess ball courses and some other stuff so it's been good sort of creative wise in some ways yeah Excellent. Simon, we only have 10 minutes left. I'm being told, sure. so I want to yeah. do the quick fire sure. questions with you as well. Of course, okay. I hope you yeah. haven't seen or heard them all. So yeah. um, same as for Niels, I will give you one yeah. pass to one question. Okay. Oh dear. Not looking forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> so, Actually, right. with Niels, the first question, the very okay. first quick fire question, he took like Two minutes to answer. Okay, I'll be quick. The, the The answers might be ridiculous, but I'll be quick. Let's do. Let's do it. Then. Let's rock. And uh, okay, so the first part that I will ask you is not chess related, and then okay. later we'll talk about some chess. So okay, first one. If you were an animal, what would you be? I would either be a tiger or a sloth, depending on my mood. I like tigers; they're pretty cool. And sloths have a fantastic life by what I see on the nature programs. Yeah. Excellent answer. Which superpower would you like to have? Ooh, uh, either invisibility, that'd be quite cool. I go, you know, uh, or um, maybe to stop time as well. That, that'd be that'd be awesome. I like to stop time, and you know, I could get a couple of extra hours preparation in. You know, Simon, awesome. these are quick fire questions, okay, not okay. either go, go, go. or. Go, go, go. <laughs> I like how we always get two options and we pick our favorite. Um, oh, okay, oh, oh. what's the strangest thing you have ever eaten? Uh, probably sheep's head, <laughs> an eyeball. Yeah, if you had a time machine, where and when would you go? So which area and which place? Uh, Chess-wise, uh, to New Orleans when Morphe was playing, some of the bars there. You know, I, I'll go and join him for a couple of jars. Um, yeah, Sounds that's good. And non chess wise? Um, I don't know. Maybe the to Japan in the samurai era. <laughs> Another interesting choice. Um, which three people would you invite to dinner? Oh dear. Um, uh, Jim Morrison, uh, Eva Green, and maybe Slash from Guns N' Roses. Excellent. 
Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram? You're not. I know uh, you Twitter. Are on Twitter. Describe yourself in three yeah. words. Uh, ginger. Um, I'm uh, rather excessive. That's that's three words already, isn't it? Uh, and um, that's more than three words. I have to leave it there. Okay, let's leave it there. What's your favourite movie? Oh dear, there's a lot of them. Uh, usual Suspects. Favourite artist? Salvador Dali. And a musical artist? Um, either The Doors or Guns N' Roses, probably. Favourite song? Um, has to be Paradise City, as you know. <laughs> Actually, that is such a pity. Why did I not prepare? Simon gave the yeah. best karaoke rendition of Paradise City ever. If I... If not, oh. when I have you back on the show, we'll watch your karaoke. <laughs> okay. Someday. Yeah. Um, your favorite food? Ooh, I, I like everything. So literally everything. Um, <laughs> um, I will go for steak. <laughs> and favorite drink? Um, probably a nice wine or a beer. Which one? You can't always have two. Okay. Um, <laughs> I will go for a glass of carver at the moment. What yeah. was your favorite subject in school? Um, art. And your favorite sport besides chess? I used to play a lot of football and swim for nationally as well, believe I it or not. I did not know that. Yeah. I did not know that. Which compliment do you receive the most? that I'm a weak man's towel. <laughs> what is the last book you have read? Ooh, uh, the, the Club Dumas, uh, which is um, a, a, a book about the film of Johnny Depp, uh, The Knife Gate, basically, oh. the book of that. Yeah. Interesting. And what would you say is your best quality? Um, I am quite bouncer back at ball and, um, I can, you know, uh, good at, I'm quite open to all sorts of communication. I'm pretty, pretty laid back in general. Did you just uh, say bounce back a I did. I don't even know if that's a word. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it is I, now. I could pick myself up and, um, but I, yeah, I, 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 I can communicate with anyone. I'm, you know, very open to communication whatever that means <laughs> just for our american viewers by football did you mean soccer no i meant football which is soccer i suppose <laughs> oh there blasphemy blasphemy so now uh, on to the on to the chess quick fire questions which opening will you never play uh, i'll probably play them all but the berlin i knew you were gonna say that yeah, I'll probably give it a go at some point, though. Why not? When you're but old. When I'm really old or dead. <laughs> so, yeah. Which chess player would you take with you on a desert island? Um, someone very big that I could eat. <laughs> no one springs to mind. <laughs> who, do you, who would you not take with you? Who would you not want to be stranded with on a desert island chess player? Um... Pass. Oh, you both use your passes on I'll this delete. one. I can't I'll believe I'll it. Yeah. <laughs> no more passes <laughs> next time. Uh, one word that describes you as a player. Um, exotic. <laughs> Who's your favorite chess streamer? Not me. I know last time they said it was awkward. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't, oh, I don't, careful I don't watch now. About it. Hello, John. How you doing? John, hello, John Bartholomew. And everyone else who's joined in. My favourite chess streamer. Um, well, um, I can't. I don't really know. It's a really hard one. I mean, John's very good. I'm going to have to say John now. He's, you know, he's popped up. John Bartholomew. There I you mean, go. That timing. Yeah. John must be psychic. Hello, John. By the way, it's a <laughs> pleasure having you here. We're doing quick fire questions. Yeah. And I say, who's your favorite streamer? And John Bartholomew. Do you think John was watching the whole time? And He's waiting? Just waiting. I think he was waiting for that moment. And he was like, hello, I'm here. You can mention my name now. <laughs> so, no, John's a great guy. John's a great guy. Yeah. Shout out to John yeah. Bartholomew, of course, who talked yeah. about Jezebel uh, earlier. He also has yeah. a boot camp coming up on Coach S, So you'll be seeing a lot more of John. 
And uh, let's continue. Which player's prep would you steal if you could? So if you could hack into one player's computer. Ooh. Kramnik's. Kramnik's. And yeah. which player would you ask for opening advice in general? Uh, Kramnik? <laughs> I think, yeah, Kramnik. Someone, someone who's solid but interesting. Yeah. Who is your favorite Twitter account to follow? Actually, both chess and non-chess. Okay. Well, I like uh, Larry the Cat, who is a, and also, obviously, I have to say my cat, Charlie the Chess Cat. But Larry the Cat is the VIP, you know, big dog of the cat world. Uh, chess wise, um, what do I like? Well, I mean, a, any of the new sites is pretty cool. Like, you know, so any of them, so, you know, follow a bit. Actually, maybe we should give a shout out. We talked about Queen's Gambit earlier. Olympia Urkan has posted yeah. some great oh, content. I, oh, by the way, I should say Olympia is very good. I do like Olympia's. Yeah, he's, he'd be up there with the Twitter profiles. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Must follow. Uh, classical Rapid Blitz or Bullet? Uh, certainly not bullets. I mean, I, I'm really at the moment missing classical. I, I, I can't wait to play classical over the board again, where you can have a lot of time to think about ideas. So classical. Your favorite world champion? Um, Mikhail Tao. Easy. I yep. This one I knew as well. What would you be if not a chess player? Dear. Um, I don't know. I can't really see myself ever having a nine to five job. Uh, to be honest, musician. <laughs> so yeah, let's go for that. Musician. Shout out as well to Mr. Dodgy, yeah. who also is a great Twitter follower of course. He's very. I, I forgot about. How could I forget about Mr. Dodgy? What's wrong with me? You should check out. He's he's one of the most. Yeah, he's one of the most funniest guys on Twitter. I should have him on this show. He would be a great. Yeah. He would have a lot of things to say about a lot of things. Um, Get him on. Yeah. Simon, yeah. your greatest achievement in chess. Uh, probably becoming a grandmaster, I, I think. Yeah. And so. the last one was actually going to be what would you name your opening if you invented one? Would you say that the Jabava London, you named that, yeah? As, I don't think that's and really the me. Black it's, Lion. It, no, I mean, the Black Lion came from a book before me by some Dutch guys, so I didn't name that. And the Jabava London has to be attributed to the great Jabava. Um, so. so then my question stands what would you name your opening if you invented one? Ginger, ginger booze, <laughs> or ginger magic, a bit of ginger magic we go for. So yeah. Simon, yeah. that is a perfect way to end the show. Actually, there was just one last question, a quick one. If you had yeah. to choose only one, which one, that was from Pandora's box from, uh, from Twitch. If you had to choose only one, which one would it be? The French or the Dutch? Dutch. The Dutch. Easy, easy. <laughs> yeah. Simon. Yeah. This is the end, I'm afraid. I think there's another show coming up here on Chess24. Um, but it's been such a pleasure, uh, as always. Some very interesting insights. And uh, I certainly hope to have you on again in the future. People should check out, should follow you, of course, on Twitch, on Twitter, everywhere. Do check out his courses on Chessable and also check out gingerjam.com, of course. Simon, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. It's always a pleasure. Uh, we're, we're, as everyone knows, very good friends. And thank you to everyone who's come along in the chat as well. So it's great to see so many of you there. And of course, if you brought my chessboard courses, double thanks. You know, it does help a lot. And uh, hopefully I'll be back again in the future. So I'll let you finish the show now, Fiona. And I guess I'll log off, shall I? Thank you, so, Simon. Yes, thank okay. you very much for your time. Cheers. It's been a pleasure. Have a good night. And bye, you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Okay, so that was Simon Williams, everyone. This is the end of this very first ever Last Chess Week uh, tonight. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. We will be back next week with some new guests. Um, this was still a trial run for me. I'm sort of trying to figure out what works best, but I hope, hope you learned some interesting things tonight um, and got to know Got to know our, our two guests a bit better. Thank you to Niels and to Simon once again. I'm signing off for now. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you another time. Take good care. Bye. Bye.